chapter 2. You know I have a Bible, there's some there in the pews, and the page numbers are in the bulletin for you. I notice as I look around there's some more red faces, so I know you've been enjoying the sun like we have been. Weekly, I record the sermons, I post them on Facebook and YouTube um, for people to watch, and they do get quite a few views. And I've noticed there's a white glare when I look down and read normally, so hopefully it'll just be like a red glare. <laughs> That's all my head. So, I, uh, one other thing I noticed last night, I'm at the... Uh, getting ready for bed, shaving, all that stuff. You know, the, Olivia is when I noticed my first grayish type of hair. And uh, I didn't think much about it. And last night, I'm looking, I'm like, wow. And so I have these little white hairs coming out now. I'm like, what is happening? But you know, it's life. It's daily life. And the Bible, as we've seen, and as I like to point out often, is it affects everyday life. The Bible speaks on everyday life matters in various stages of life. Um, there are common questions we have that the Bible speaks to. And this morning we're going to look at a few more of those in Titus chapter 2. We'll start in verse 1. But as we begin, the first point is daily living should be grounded in sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Let's read verse 1. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Simple verse, but a weighty verse. Teach what accords with sound doctrine. So Paul, as we learned last week, we ended with looking at false teachers. And I talked kind of passionately about that. The warnings against false teachers. Well now, Paul is telling Titus the opposite of of what a false teacher is. He's telling them what a Christian's life should be about. And we see that by the word but. Verse 2, verse or chapter 2, verse 1, it starts with but. Now when you see that word, when you're reading, it's a transition word. So you always want to go back and see what was there before. And as we're seeing here, Paul is giving instructions to Titus on what it means to be a Christian and the opposite of being a false teacher. Learning by imitation is found throughout the Bible. It's a means of sanctification. We learn from Jesus. We learn from the apostles. And we learn from other characters in the scriptures that we should model ourselves after. And we'll see more of that today as we dive into chapter 2. But first, let's look at sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? Now, as we think about that, I, I like to think of it as we all live by something. We have principles or a code or a conduct or something that we all live by. Now, Paul tells Titus to live by sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. I'll explain more as we get going. But now the word here, uh, sound, basically is another word for saying healthy. So we're looking at what is healthy doctrine? What is good for you? One definition, and this morning, I don't often do this, I should probably, but if you want to know more, there's this easy to read book, Sound Doctrine by Bobby Jameson. Really good. Help me as I thought through how to talk about this this morning. It's from Nine Marks, a trusted organization. If you want to know more, pick it up, or I'll just leave it up here and you can come look at it if you'd like. Um, but sound doctrine is a summary of the Bible's teaching that is both faithful to the Bible and useful for life. So here's a few things. The Bible is for, the first part of that definition says, the Bible is the teaching we need for sound doctrine. And second, the Bible is useful for life. So another way we could say that is, the Bible is useful for everyday daily living. So we look at it. This is good news because we have the Bible right in front of us. There's been generations that did not have it. 
before us. But we have the teachings of the scripture right here before us. So, the scripture says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, important verse, write it down. Look at it later if you can't get there right now. But 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So, let's look at a few things. First, the Bible is inspired by God. Simply means God was... What was written in our scriptures is what God wanted to be written there. Through some supernatural means, he inspired through the authors what we have and find in the scriptures today. Second, that verse tells us the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us. It teaches us about life. It teaches us about family. It teaches us about so many different things. Third, the Bible reproves us. So there's sin in our lives. The Bible calls us out. In other words, you could use as admonish. The Bible calls us out, admonishes us in our sins. Fourth, the Bible corrects us. It doesn't only point out the sin, but it corrects us and tells us what we should be doing different. Fifth, the Bible trains us for righteousness. So it, don't, it doesn't only call us out and correct us. The Bible tells us how we could prevent the sin in the first place. It tells us how we can live this life and in the end for good works. It equips us for good works. We have a very powerful book. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we see that there's life in the pages of the Bible. It teaches us how to live our lives. Sound doctrine is needed so that we might glorify God in this Christian life. But you may ask, why should I care? Why should I care? Well, here's the answer. It's from this book again. But he says, sound doctrine breeds holiness not only in our lives, but also in the corporate life of the church. Through preaching and teaching, singing, prayer, and modeling, sound doctrine is for holiness. Sound doctrine is the lifeblood of the church. So if we're going to be committed as Christians to what God wants, our doctrine, what we rule our lives by, what we let guide our lives, should be the Word of God. Because it's the sound doctrine that comes from the Word that leads us to holiness and that we might glorify God with our lives. So, as I thought about this, often in the scriptures, uh, Paul and Peter compare the Christian life to warfare, right? They talk about preparing for the battle or being ready for what will come. Um, it's not unlike many games we play, you know, where you have to have strategy. Libby's been big into Minecraft right now. Some of you know what that is. Some of you don't. It's a game where you build stuff. It's like Legos. Or a game, mobile device. Or there's another game out, Tyler and Mason introduced me to Fortnite. And I got all the kids' attention now because they all know what that is, right? So in that game, which I'm finding I'm not very good at, um, you have to build things in order to be successful. Or you have to gain things in the game in order to win. Well, in the Christian life, here's the connection. Tyler's all excited about this. You know? <laughs> But in the Christian life, it's kind of like we have to be pouring into ourselves these sound doctrinal truths that are in the scriptures that we find right here. These things that give us life, that prepare us for the battle that's ahead, that prepare us for life, how to live daily for Jesus. It's all right here. So part of our lives is that we need to prepare for the battle by putting on and soaking up as much sound doctrine as we can. Because we, the fight will come, but when it comes, we do not know. We must be ready. In light of that, Paul points out 
several characteristics in the following verses, verses 2 through 8, which we'll look at next, that will help us in this fight. So, let's read verses 2 through 8. Daily living should be about discipling and loving others. I'm not, and this morning, I'm not pointing out heavy application because the good thing about Paul is that in these type of passages, it's all application. So as we read this, realize, oh, this is the application we need. Um, starting verse 2. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. A lot here. I get that, and we'll break it down. We'll look at by age groups and gender groups. But Paul is addressing specific characteristics that should be about uh, the family structure. Things that older men, older women, younger men, younger women should be characterized by and should be out of love, discipling others with. Obviously, in the, in the early church, this would have been an important deal. And at some point, we've lost some of this. I don't know when. This thing's giving me issues today. I don't know why. I had it fixed last week. I must have knocked it. There we go. I don't know when it happened, but we've lost some of this discipling focus in the church today. And I'm not sure why, but as we look at this, we'll see ways that we can help and love other people. First, Paul calls out older men. Now this would have been, and this is the best part about expository preaching, is that I would normally not call, uh, refer to people as older men, older women, because you can run uh, issues there. But Paul calls it out. Older men. Now this would have referred to somebody that was probably over the age of 60. So we're looking at that age range. But Paul says this, that older men should exhibit. He says they should be sober-minded, which means they should be level-headed. They should be dignified, which means they should be worthy of respect. They should be self-controlled, which in this particular passage means they should be discerning. And last, he says, they should be sound in faith, love, and steadfastness. Which in other words could mean, or does mean, that they should be confident in Christ. Now, Paul moves, and this is, a lot of the New Testament writers did this during this time. It bugs me personally, but he skips to older women without going right into the younger men. I don't know why they wrote that way in those days, but they did. So, second, he calls out older women. Look at verse 3. Again, this would be anyone age 60 or older. He says they should be reverent in behavior. They should be, they should not be slanderers. They shouldn't be known as gospelers, but those who speak truth. They should not be slaves to wine. Means they should be, have self-control over their appetites and their actions. Fourth, he says, they should be able to teach what is good. And that means to disciple others. And then he switches to younger women. Look at verses 4 and 5. Younger women. Now this would have been anyone from age 12 up to 60, 59. He says this. He says older women should train the younger women to do these things. First, love their husbands. Second, love their children. 
And this doesn't mean just the natural love that a mother in particular has for their children. It also refers, this particular word, as we see in the scriptures, one word can have a lot of meanings. When I use the word love, I can say I love ice cream, but that looks different than I love my kids. Right? You see the difference there. So this particular word also talks about not just the natural love a mother has for their kids, but it refers to the type of love that cultivates through discipline and training godly character in the lives of their kids. Love your kids. Third, he says, younger women should be self-controlled. They should have good judgment. Fourth, he says, they should be pure. And this word refers to both morally and ethically. Fifth, he says, they should be workers at home. I know this is a debated topic, um, but in this context, I believe it refers to the, the ability a wife has to keep and maintain her home. Uh, we see that throughout Scripture, women had multiple jobs, and I don't have an issue with that, as long as their home is operating effectively. That is what this context and word means. Six, they should be kind, which means good, gentle, considerate, gracious. And last, they should be submissive to their husbands. Now, I dealt with this in 1 Peter, the whole submission issue, because I know it's debated. It's a hot issue. And I was thankful for the positive feedback, because there are certain topics when you preach, you're like, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I don't know what the response is going to be, and that's one of these, uh, the submission issue, because I know it's so debated, but I'm thankful uh, that so many of you said, thank you. Thank you for preaching on that topic. It helps. Uh, but in this passage, it's clear wives should submit to their husbands. That's what older women should be teaching younger women on how to do. And the basis for that comes from Ephesians 5, 22-23. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. So like I said when we were in 1 Peter, the wife's submission to her husband is more than just about marriage. It paints a bigger picture of the church submitting to Christ. It has gospel implications when we obey and do as the word commands us to do. So our marriages are not so much about our marriages. It's more about making much of Christ. That's why we submit. Men, that's why we are called to lead our families. We make much of Christ in those things. And then last, younger men. Again, age 12 and up to 60. That's who this refers to. Look at verse 6. We see what he says. He says one thing, right? They should be self-controlled. It should be self-controlled. You may say, well, that's kind of a cop-out. But uh, in this context, we don't have an exhaustive list of things. There's so many other fruits of the Spirit that we should be putting on as well. But self-control, I believe, is specifically called out here because it's such a big issue. Now, self-control that is used in this context refers more to the mind than actions, but we also know that what we think leads to actions. Self-control is used in every age group. Why? I believe it's because we know how hard self-control is. Guys, we know how hard self-control is. Whether it's anger, love, eating, those things like um, online issues, pornography, or something else, we know Self-control can be a hard thing. And I believe that's why God says older men teach younger men how to do it. We need to be taught how to be self-controlled. And I'm lumping myself in this younger men because that's where I qualify as. I need help in learning what many of you who have been through it can teach me. And we are grateful for that. Last, all ages. Look at verses 7 through 8. Paul wants everyone to characterize three things. First, be a model of good works. 
In other words, set a good example for others. Second, you should be able to teach the gospel with integrity and dignity. Now that level of teaching varies. But you should be able to teach at least some portion of scripture to, let's say, a child. We should get to the place where we're able to do that. And third, you should be blameless when you speak. Don't give people an opportunity to speak against you. Don't give them any grounds for attacking you. Cover your speech with love and the scriptures. Now, as I thought about this, I know this is kind of a weighty section here and heavy application for all of us. But, you know, we were outside picking up sticks. I don't know, Friday, I guess. A lot of people stopped by, and we're picking up all these sticks, and all of a sudden, I started looking at the trees, and you know, one tree's like this, like this, the power lines, you know, kind of bent a little bit, and other tree's kind of straight, um, and I'm thinking about trees, for whatever reason, my mind goes in odd directions when I'm getting ready to mow, uh, I just start thinking about different things, and I once knew a guy who was a tree farmer. And for a good tree, a straight tree, we've seen them, it takes a lot of work to make sure that tree is straight. Put in the trimming, you put in ropes, you have to do all these things to make it look good. Well, as I thought about that, it applies to us today. If we are going to be the Christians that God wants us to be, it's going to take work. We must put in the work. Excuse me, for was again. We must put in the work as Christians to be the type of person that Paul says we should be characterized by. Even more, as young, younger men and women, we should, because we need help, we should be going to these older men and women for that help. Older men and women, be ready to help us because we need it. We need your wisdom. We need your experience. We need help in a lot of these areas. We should be people. We should be a church who looks to help by loving one another, disciple each other to grow in these areas. To grow in these areas. Verses 9 and 10. Daily living should make much of Jesus. Verse 9. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters and everything. They are to be well pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So now Paul turns to bond servants, or in this context, employees. All right. Now it's no secret working in the Roman during Roman times was no easy task. Uh, employers were very harsh with their employees. But Paul, and I believe that's part of why he's calling out employees to live a certain way. He says they should do a few things. First, work hard. Work hard for your employer. Second, work with a good attitude. Work with a good attitude. We know the temptation to complain when we're working, right? We know that temptation to grumble at work. We should, in whatever we do, seek to glorify God, and that means with a good attitude. Third, work submissively. Paul wants believers to obey their bosses and not argue with them. Fourth, work honestly. Now he uses that word pilfering in verse 10. Pilfering refers to embezzlement. Be honest in your work. Work hard for the Lord. Don't take advantage of the man. Fifth, work with sincerity. Now that word good faith that we found there in verse 10 simply means that you are to be loyal. Be loyal. And what's interesting is, is that he doesn't give a qualifying whether it's a good employer or not. We should be loyal to who has taken the opportunity to employ us. Last, you should work with humility. Verse 10, look back. It said, so that in everything 
and they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So when we work, and we're commanded to work in, in Genesis after the fall, or even before the fall actually, we were commanded to work, but it became intensified after sin entered the world. So as we are called to work, and as we work, it is about more than just our jobs. Our work is a representation of Jesus to those who we are working for. So, and you could put it like this, our work is our daily, weekly mission field. We are called to live on mission for Jesus. And when we remember this, our work becomes more than just something we do. It becomes, it has a purpose. You know, Yes, we are to get our jobs done and to work hard, but it is about more than that. Our primary goal is that we want to see people come to the doctrine of God our Savior. That is our goal in our work primarily. Now, I know there's rules about talking about Jesus and things in the workplace, but that doesn't mean you can't build a relationship and have conversations outside of that place. Take advantage of those opportunities, remembering Romans 6, 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it ends in eternal life. So our work that we do is about Jesus first, others second. That is what Paul is trying to tell Titus here. Because there must have been an issue with how employees were working for those they were working for. So Paul is saying, no, keep the perspective right. Your job is for Jesus. I read this in a devotional. Listen to this. It, it was good. This guy said, you need to see all of life as spiritual. And your calling or employment as work for God, work for God, regardless of pay, position, or its connection to the church. In other words, stop treating what you spend the bulk of your day engaged in as something divorced from God and His work in and through you. Your work is one of the primary ways in which you will glorify God. Your calling is to be faithful to God where you are. And in doing this, all work is sacred, spiritual, and worthy of your full attention and energy. When you get to work, you are not entering a secular environment as much as you are bringing the sacred into the world by following Christ wherever you are. Wherever you are. Titus 2, 1 through 10, is simple in that it lays out applications for all of us. It calls us to live daily for Jesus and to become like Him. These specific characteristics point us to things in our lives that we should be working on. Specifically, we should be grounded in sound doctrine, loving and discipling others and making much of Jesus. See, when we live godly lives that adorn the gospel, we are putting on display in our lives Jesus' character to the world. We make much of Jesus when we seek to be what God calls us to be like. And for Christians, this is a heavy call. And I know myself included, part of this discipling, loving one another, and older men teaching younger men, older women teaching younger women, younger men teaching children, younger women teaching children, is that we need each other in this life. We need the community of believers to accomplish what God calls us to do. He never called us to be solo Christians. He called us to do this together. Where we fail, where we sin, repent. Seek God's forgiveness. He will forgive you. And yet, for those who say this makes no sense, 
I don't understand still why it's not, why I don't think this is very serious. Maybe it's because you never realized the seriousness of your sin and your need for a Savior. There is hope for you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matthew and Mark say, repent and believe in the gospel. You know, I don't think anyone, specifically older men, older women who have been Christians for many, many years, anyone would say it's not been worth it. I think you would say it's been hard at times, but it's always been worth it. It's always been joyful to know and experience living for the Lord. There's nothing that compares. So I beg with you, if you don't know Jesus today, repent and believe the gospel today. Repent and believe. See me this week. Send me a message. Let's get together. Let's talk about it. Reach out to me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. I thank you, God, for people like Paul and Titus. The relationship they showed. One man pouring his life into a younger man to make much of you. And I pray today that this will model our lives in the church, that we will want to see each other grow in our faith, and we'll fight the temptations to complain, to grumble, to grow bitter, but we will seek to love one another. Sometimes that means we confront one another. Sometimes that means we encourage one another. Sometimes that means we just stop by and talk or share a gift with others. I pray that all of this will make much of you, and even more so, that as we do these things, as unbelievers see us caring and loving one another, that they will want to hear more about this gospel, about this Jesus, and will experience the transforming life that he gives. In your name we pray, amen. We'll please stand. Our closing hymn will be on page 415.